Welcome back to The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology. This is presentation number 25 out of 30 on Exercise Physiology, Part 1. So this is The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology, and uh, we're moving through the topics here. Uh, we want to approach this with the enthusiasm of a child in the candy shop. And so today we're going to be discussing in Exercise Physiology the pinnacle of human performance. Exercise is the story of energy, challenges of maximal exercise, how do we measure aerobic fitness, adaptation to exercise, and the anaerobic threshold. So this will be the first part of two of exercise physiology. So the pinnacle of human performance. Usain Bolt set the 100 meter world record at 9.58 seconds. Caleb Dressel set the 100 meter butterfly world record at 47 0.78 seconds. Hikam El Garoch set the 1500 meter run world record at 3 minutes 27.65 seconds. And Albert Career runs a marathon in 2 hours 8 minutes and 22 seconds. The uh, slogan of the Olympic Games is Sidious Altius Fortius, swifter, higher, stronger. So how do they do that? How do these people exercise at such an incredible level of performance? So exercise is the story of energy. So why study exercise physiology in respiratory physiology? So exercise requires the cardiorespiratory system to perform at a higher level. Exercise brings out abnormalities not evident when the system has lesser demands at rest. The physiologic challenges required at heavy exercise mimic those required during critical illness. So some aspects of what we learn translate to, for example, critical care medicine. Exercise is the story of energy. For muscles to perform work, they must generate energy, which is cellular energy production, which requires delivery of oxygen, which is the circulation, which requires ventilation, which are the lungs. Some exercise does not require sustained work output like strength or power sports. Usain Bolt set the 100 meter world record at 9.58 seconds. Muscle energy production is necessary for muscle work output, but in this case, it must generate the, the energy anaerobically because 9.58 seconds is not enough time for the cardiorespiratory system to deliver oxygen to exercising muscles. Strength and power are proportional to muscle cross-sectional area. So the activity for most strength and power supports is not sustained. So the energy stored in muscle is used. There's little need to deliver increased oxygen to exercising muscle over this short period of time. So muscle work output equals muscle energy stores plus muscle energy production. If you have to run a 10 second race, you have to run it on muscle energy stores. There's no time for energy production. Albert Career runs a marathon in two hours, eight minutes, 22 seconds. Sustained work output is required for aerobic exercise. Fatigue is the inability to sustain a given workload. Endurance is the ability to sustain work at a certain level. This requires oxygen delivery to exercising muscle or cardiorespiratory fitness. So again, muscle work output equals energy stores plus energy production. If you have to run a two hour race, you have to run it on muscle energy production. There's enough, not enough energy stores to finish the race. Human skeletal muscle is composed of basically two types of muscle fibers. Slow twitch fibers, which contain a number of muscle fibers with high aerobic capacity, high oxidative enzymes. So these muscles are relatively fatigue resistant. The muscle um, twitches in a uh, energy uh, efficient manner and it produces more energy. Fast twitch mu muscle fibers are mostly glycolytic. That is, they do not have aerobic uh, oxidative enzymes 
And consequently, they have an initial burst of energy, but this cannot be sustained. So fast switch fibers, which use energy relatively inefficiency and don't produce energy, are relatively fast fatiguing. And then there are intermediate muscle types as well. Basically, energy production um, is, according to biochemistry, uh, one consumes oxygen. This goes through the cell into the mitochondrial membrane. If glucose is metabolized, for example, it goes down to pyruvate. If it's metabolized aerobically, it goes into the tricarboxylic acid or Krebs cycle. And one mole of glucose produces 46 to 48 moles of ATP if metabolized aerobically. In the absence of oxygen, pyruvate goes to lactate. And only two moles of ATP are produced aerobically for metabolism of one mole of glucose. So clearly, oxygen metabolism is a much more efficient way to produce energy than anaerobically. What's shown here is aerobic metabolism is completely performed by the aerobic mechanism. Oxygen plus a substrate consumed produces energy plus CO2, which is removed. If you have a higher level of energy than one can, can meet aerobically, then you have aerobic plus anaerobic metabolism. So oxygen plus a substrate produce aerobic energy, but also produce extra energy through lactate, which produces extra CO2 because of isocapnic buffering. We'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in just a moment. So there's extra CO2 produced uh, with anaerobic metabolism in addition to that produced um, metabolically by aerobic metabolism. So Wasserman and Whip, two pioneering uh, exercise physiologists, tend to depict the way the, the way the body does exercise with this gear model. You need to consume oxygen. This is inspired in the lungs. The pulmonary circulation translates this to the systemic circulation, to the heart, which increases its output, there's a peripheral circulation which takes oxygen into muscle and ultimately into mitochondria. This produces CO2, which comes back, released in the peripheral circulation. Increased cardiac output brings it into the pulmonary circulation where it's exhaled in the lungs. Exercising muscle produces increased energy to perform increased work. So this requires oxygen to deliver to exercising muscles. It requires cardiac output to maximal levels, and it requires increased ventilation, but not quite to pulmonary maximum. Work output depends on energy production. Aerobic energy requires oxygen. Energy production can be measured as oxygen consumption, and maximal work output correlates with maximal oxygen consumption. So what are the challenges to the body of maximal exercise? We're comparing here rest and exercise, and I want to remind you about the Fick equation, where oxygen consumption equals cardiac output times the difference in oxygen content between arterial and venous blood. So oxygen consumption at rest in a normal 70 kilogram man at rest is about 250 mLs per minute or 0.25 liters per minute. At max exercise, it's about 10 times that, 2.5 liters per minute. Uh, the, the level of exercise in terms of O2 consumption at rest is designated as one met, one metabolic unit, and consequently at maximum exercise, you're at 10 mets, 10 multiples of resting O2 consumption. Cardiac output increases from about 5 liters per minute at rest to about 21 liters per minute at maximum exercise. The AO2 difference, or trill to venous O2 difference in oxygen content, is about 5 mLs per deciliter at rest, about 16 mLs per deciliter at heavy exercise, and the partial pressure of venous O2 is about 45 to 50 at rest and can be as high as 80 tor in blood draining exercising muscle. There is reduced oxygen content of blood entering the pulmonary capillary and reduced time for diffusion. This is a challenge to the cardiorespiratory system of maximum exercise. All cardiac output goes through the lungs, so there needs to be a way to counter the tendency for pulmonary edema. There's a 20 times increase in ventilation, which increases energy expenditure from the ventilatory muscles. This shows metabolic rate in an individual, normal individual in an exercise 
rated exercise stress test or cardiopulmonary exercise test. This person increases metabolic rate with exercise from about maybe 400 ml per minute up to about 2.2 liters per minute at maximum exercise. And what's plotted on this axis is ventilation. So you can see that this individual went from about 10 liters per minute ventilation at rest to about 70 liters per minute ventilation at max exercise. The blue trapezoid represents metabolic rate, which is non-respiratory. The red indicates the metabolic portion of the metabolic rate, which is respiratory. That is, which basically is used by the ventilatory muscles to provide ventilation. It's not surprising this increases a little bit at high levels of ventilation. But even at these high levels, respiratory metabolism is a small fraction of total metabolic rate. That is, ventilatory muscle function is not something that limits exercise performance in normal individuals. This is a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease undergoing the same test. Notice that this person does not exercise as much. O2 consumption is only about a third what it was in the previous case. And ventilation is not as high. This person's max ventilation is 30 liters per minute. But note how much of the total body metabolism and exercise is due to respiratory metabolism. So here, work of breathing is considerable, and about a third of the total metabolic rate is used to power the ventilatory muscles to provide adequate ventilation. Maximum oxygen consumption is dependent on the type of exercise being performed. Maximum oxygen consumption is greater if the exercising muscle mass is greater. So this shows the maximal oxygen consumption in mLs per kilo per minute in elite athletes in a variety of men's sports. So cross-country skiing has the highest uh, maximum O2 consumption at about 78.3 mLs per kilogram per minute. You can see middle distance running, down a little bit, marathon, swimming, uh, tennis, not too much, speed skating, and so on. So you get the idea here that cross-country skiing involves not only the legs, but also the arms. And that's one of the reasons this is the highest. This is max aerobic power for women's sports. And really the order of sports is about the same, but women have a slightly lower maximum O2 consumption than men pretty much across the board here. With respect to how one exercises again, the things that have to happen with exercise is one has to increase ventilation to get sufficient oxygen in place. The pulmonary circulation will modify in ways I will show you in a minute. There's capillary recruitment and dilatation. Uh, the heart increases cardiac output. Peripheral circulation dilates around exercising muscle. And uh, the mitochondria produces more energy. There are more oxidative enzymes in cells to uh, produce ATP. CO2 produced here is removed. Peripheral circulation again is, is uh, increased around exercising muscles. Cardiac output is increased to remove CO2. Pulmonary circulation again is modified, and then all the CO2 can be exhaled with increased ventilation. How do we measure aerobic exercise? So if an individual has a 75% fall in physiologic function from some disease, it would be nice if our observation techniques showed us that this person had a 75% fall. However, traditional clinical observation medical history, physical examination, uh, this is far from the case. One can have perhaps even a 50% drop in actual function before it is noticed. If we use pulmonary function testing, we're a little bit better. We can detect a fall in physiologic function a bit earlier. But if we use exercise stress testing, we can be closer to this ideal uh, line and we can detect the fall in physiologic function much closer to what actually occurs. So exercise stress testing or cardiopulmonary uh, exercise stress tests or incremental exercise or graded exercise stress tests basically allow us to pick up abnormal function closer to what is the actual loss in physiologic function. So work output depends on energy production. Aerobic energy requires oxygen. So energy production can be measured as oxygen consumption. Maximal work output correlates with maximal oxygen consumption. So this is how we measure aerobic fitness. We can do 
greater exercise stress test, for example, on a bicycle ergometer or on a treadmill, we can measure non-invasively oxygen consumption, CO2 production, the rest to exchange ratio, as measures of metabolic rate. Cardiac function, we can do heart rate and ECG. And respiratory function, we can measure minute ventilation. Ventilatory equivalents for oxygen or CO2 and oxygen saturation of hemoglobin and end-time carbon dioxide tension. Oxygen consumption equals the amount of oxygen inspired minus the amount of oxygen exhaled. The difference is what is consumed. So we need to measure both inspired ventilation and exhaled minute ventilation, VI and VE. And we need to measure both FiO2, fraction of inspired oxygen, and fraction of exhaled oxygen. So this is the formula. Oxygen consumption equals inspired minute ventilation times FiO2 minus exhaled minute ventilation times FeO2. Traditionally, in the good old days, we used to do this by measuring exhaled gas, as you can see here. There's a one-way valve and exhaled gas was collected, either in a Douglas bag or a TSOS parameter. And the system used a one-way valve like this, so we inspired, metabolism occurred, and we exhaled fraction of exhaled oxygen. This is not end tidal, but mixed expired oxygen. So historically, as I mentioned, we can only measure exhaled gases. Um, we collected the exhaled gas over time, measured FeO2, but can we measure VI, inspired minute ventilation? Does VI equal VE? So the rest to exchange ratio is CO2 production divided by oxygen consumption. If the R ratio is one, then the volume of O2 equals the volume of CO2, and VI would equal VE. But the normal value for R is 0.8 at rest, and R changes during exercise. So we need to be able to measure that, and we use nitrogen. Nitrogen is neither excreted nor absorbed in the lungs. Thus, nitrogen inhaled must equal nitrogen exhaled. Nitrogen inhaled is inspired minute ventilation times fraction of inspired nitrogen, and it equals the exhaled minute ventilation times fraction of exhaled nitrogen. Again, mixed expired, not end time. And then we can recombine this, and VI equals VE times FEN2 over an FIN2. So we can, in fact, measure oxygen consumption because we can calculate VI, and that's what we did um, here, as you can see substituted this for VI, and that gives us this formula for oxygen consumption. But computer systems, uh, which are commonly used now, can actually measure inspired minute ventilation, so we don't really need to do this. Uh, you should just know, however, that it is possible. With respect to calculating CO2 production, CO2 production equals expired minute ventilation times fraction of exhaled CO2 minus inspired minute ventilation times fraction of inspired CO2. But global warming aside, FiO2 is essentially zero. So there's no need to calculate VI. VCO2 equals VE times FeCO2. So in terms of measuring CO2 production, we again have this one-way valve. We collect, can collect exhaled gas. So of course, with the computer, we can do that. So work output depends on energy production. Aerobic energy requires oxygen. Energy production can be measured as oxygen consumption, and the maximal work output correlates with maximal oxygen consumption. The anaerobic threshold is another measure of aerobic capacity, and we measure other parameters to assess the limitation to maximal exercise. So what about the adaptation to exercise? What do we do? What does the body do to allow us to perform exercise maximally? So let's imagine a situation where somebody exercises at a high work level for four minutes, all right? Heart rate will increase to increase O2 delivery to exercise in muscle. Minute ventilation will increase to meet the demands of this increased oxygen consumption. And metabolic rate increases by both increase in O2 consumption and CO2 production. The problem is, if we're performing a constant work level, okay, let's say here, it requires this amount of O2 consumption, all right? But what we're actually getting is we're slowly getting up to this O2 consumption. It does not happen instantaneously. So that leaves a gap in that there was a certain amount of energy that should have been or could have been produced aerobically 
And that in the red is called the oxygen deficit. That was originally paid during exercise with anaerobic metabolism, but uh, it must be repaid at the end, and that's called the oxygen debt. Oxygen debt basically equals oxygen deficit. So if you want to watch the Olympics like a physiologist, watch for a relatively st uh, steady state in terms of ventilation and running in the middle of middle and long distance sports. And watch for repaying that oxygen debt at the end of short, middle, and long distance events. That's when they just seem to be completely breathless. In terms of maximum exercise then, what happens? So to get more oxygen in, we increase tidal volume and frequency to increase ventilation. We recruit capillaries to increase gas exchange across the pulmonary circulation. We increase cardiac output by increasing stroke volume and heart rate. We dilate the peripheral circulation around exercise of muscle, and we increase O2 consumption and CO2 production um, in the mitochondria in order to produce more energy. So this is how we, in fact, adapt to uh, the increased demands of exercise. Now, the pulmonary circulation, pulmonary arteries follow airways in the lung. So the, this is a low pressure, low resistance, high compliance circuit. The pulmonary vascular resistance is extremely low. It's about 10% of systemic vascular resistance. And low pulmonary vascular resistance is maintained despite increased cardiac output. Now, cardiac output is increasing from 5 liters per minute to 21 liters per minute. If the pulmonary circulation was rigid tubes, then the heart would have to generate exponentially increased pressures in order to generate increased flow through the same size tubes. Mother Nature was kind to us. So in the lungs, a relatively small increase in pulmonary artery pressure, as would occur with exercise, uh, increases cardiac output dramatically. So something is going on where we're not just putting more flow through rigid tubes. Looked at this way, pulmonary vascular resistance measured against cardiac output. In fact, the higher the cardiac output, the lower the pulmonary vascular resistance. So at the lung at rest, if you recall, we have some pulmonary capillaries that are closed. As we descend the lung, we increase pulmonary artery pressure, and therefore pulmonary capillaries distend or get bigger. During exercise, pulmonary artery pressure is a bit higher, and so pulmonary capillaries that were closed are now recruited or opened. And pulmonary capillaries that were open before are now distended and open larger, and therefore the pressure required to push that fluid through the circulation is not as high as it would be if these were rigid tubes. This recall is John West's model of pulmonary circulation in the lung, and he suggests in the upright lung that um, flow in a vessel is determined by the pressure inside versus out. If alveolar pressure exceeds both arterial and venous pressure, you have zone one and no flow. Flow is plotted in the horizontal axis here. As you descend the lung, pulmonary artery and venous pressure increase, so you get to the point where pulmonary artery pressure is greater than alveolar, all right? And therefore, flow is determined by this difference, and therefore, flow increases as you descend. Zone three, both pulmonary artery and venous pressure are greater than alveolar, and there's still a little bit of an increase just due to increased pressure and distension on these vessels. When you exercise, you increase cardiac output, which increases pulmonary artery pressure. So zone one is minimized. It decreases zone one of lung perfusion by dilating and recruiting alveolar pulmonary capillaries. Zone two of lung is also decreased, making the distribution of perfusion more uniform throughout the lung. This just shows wasted ventilation over total ventilation, or VDVT, and you can see that in a normal individual, Wasted ventilation decreases from about 0.3 or 30% at rest to closer to 20% as workload increases. So you are, in fact, decreasing wasted ventilation by recruiting and dilating pulmonary capillaries. We can calculate wasted ventilation. CO2 production equals fraction of exhaled CO2 times exhaled minute ventilation. But all CO2 comes from alveoli. Therefore, CO2 production also equals fraction of alveolar CO2 times alveolar ventilation. So we can make these equal to each other and then reconfigure 
Alveolar ventilation is Fe CO2, again, this is mixed expired, divided by fraction of alveolar CO2 times exhaled minute ventilation. Please note, Fe CO2 is not entitled CO2. It is mixed expired CO2. Entitled CO2 would be FET CO2. So the fraction of um, CO2 times 760 minus 47 equals PCO2. So we can convert this equation to alveolar ventilation equals minute ventilation times partial pressure of exhaled CO2 divided by partial pressure of alveolar CO2. And again, minute ventilation is VE minus VA. So a wasted ventilation is VE minus VA. This is VA from up here. Note again that this is mixed expired CO2, not entitled CO2. And the reason is that over the course of a respiratory cycle, CO2 changes in the alveolus. So you have a highest CO2 when the alveolus is compressed after exhalation, and then obviously the lowest when it's diluted by inspiration. PE CO2, mixed expired, is the average CO2 across the whole respiratory cycle. We basically get this equation for wasted ventilation. And then wasted ventilation is here. We can um, divide by VE on both sides of the equation. And we get uh, 1 minus P exhaled CO2 over P alveolar CO2. Or this VDVT, which is V wasted ventilation over total ventilation, or dead space over tidal volume, equals partial pressure of alveolar CO2 minus exhaled, mixed exhaled CO2 divided by alveolar. This could also be arterial because arterial and alveolar are closed. So as an example, if we have an alveolar CO2 of 40, which is normal, and a mixed exhaled CO2 of 20, 40 minus 20 over 40 is 50%. And that would be equivalent to what's used here. So 50% wasted ventilation. If we had an alveolar CO2 of 40 and a mixed exhaled CO2 of 30, then VDVT would be 40 minus 30 over 40, or 25%. There is controversy in this equation about whether or not one can measure VDVT non-invasively during exercise. Turns out that alveolar CO2 is not constant over the respiratory cycle of a breath. Therefore, P arterial CO2 would be required to measure VDVT during exercise. As I mentioned, it is controversial. If you actually look at values, it seems that some uh, measures of VD, VDVT during exercise non-invasively appear to be plausible. Others clearly are wrong, and then some it's just not clear. So the safest course would be to use only arterial gases to measure VDVT. Diffusion during exercise. Remember, the normal individual mixed venous O2 is 40, mixed venous CO2 is 46. Blood gets into the pulmonary, from the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary capillary. Diffusion occurs. In a normal situation, uh, arterial O2 is nearly alveolar and arterial CO2 is alveolar. And recall that this is the way diffusion works in the lungs. That is, blood enters. Um, the lung with a PO2 of 40 from the pulmonary artery. Diffusion occurs very rapidly. Remember, this is perfusion limited, all right? So that um, what hemoglobin is available is filled up with oxygen, and diffusion stops when all available hemoglobin is filled, and it leaves in the pulmonary vein very close to alveolar levels. CO2, much more diffusible than oxygen, diffuses faster and under much lower diffusion gradient. Oxygen diffusion in normal lungs, the way we could increase it would be to increase oxygen uptake, i.e. exercise. We could increase hemoglobin. There's no question that blood doping works. We could increase cardiac output, which also happens exercise. We cannot increase diffusion by increasing the diffusion gradient because diffusion is already complete while breathing room air in a normal individual. Hemoglobin is saturated in 100, and there's no, more, no other place to put oxygen. We could, however, bring out a diffusion defect by exercising at altitude, which would decrease the diffusion gradient, and, well, being at altitude, which would decrease the diffusion gradient, and or exercising, which decreases the time 
in the pulmonary capillary. And these might bring out a diffusion defect as a cause of hypoxia. Increased hemoglobin increases aerobic performance. Blood doping and erythropoietin are illegal in the Olympics. But the U.S. Olympic Training Facility is in Colorado Springs at 6,035 feet elevation. So living in high altitude increases hemoglobin naturally. So this might be kind of a natural blood doping, if you will. Ventilation increases as O2 consumption increases. And this is a rough guideline here. So O2 will increase more or less linearly with O2 consumption, but then increases non-linearly. And we'll talk about that in a minute. CO2, actually, ventilation increases linearly with CO2 production. The breathing reserve. So the breathing reserve is the maximal voluntary ventilation. This is the theoretical maximum amount of ventilation that someone can achieve minus the ventilation at maximal exercise over the maximum voluntary ventilation or MVV. The pulmonary reserve is 20 to 40% in normals, but decreased in lung disease. So here, if we plot tidal volume versus minute ventilation during an exercise stress test, you can see at maximum exercise, one could still theoretically ventilate more. And this difference is the breathing reserve. If you have obstructive disease, you may hit the mechanical limit of ventilation when you hit the limit to exercise and breathing reserve is decreased. Similarly for obstruction, the same thing, you may hit the mechanical limit of ventilation which decreases your exercise performance. So how do we minimize the work of breathing during exercise? We increase minute ventilation by both increasing tidal volume and frequency. We decrease wasted ventilation. We decrease DVDVT, and I mentioned that's by capillary recruitment and dilatation, even though wasted ventilation itself increases slightly. We decrease airway resistance. We do this by shifting to mouth breathing and by bronchodilatation. There's also vasoconstriction of nasal and pulmonary mucosa. All of these opening up the airway and decreasing airway resistance. We actively decreased end expiratory lung volume. This keeps the lung in the best part of the pressure volume curve. Here at, at normal minute ventilation in this pressure volume curve, you can see that this is the slope of, of volume versus pressure or compliance, right? During exercise, one actually goes below the FRC to stay on the um, optimal portion of this flow volume curve, if uh, this pressure volume curve. If this patient were to move up here, they'd get on a flatter portion of the curve and work of breathing would actually increase. So we actually exhale below FRC during exercise to minimize work of breathing. Now it turns out at exercise in normal subjects, you're exercising at maximal heart rate and cardiac output. But minute ventilation, you're really only exercising at about 70%, or some would say 60 to 80% of maximal ventilation. So maximal exercise, there is still reserve in pulmonary ventilation that one could tap into if cardiac output were high enough. So cardiac output increases five times and minute ventilation about 10 times at maximal exercise. Pulmonary capillary recruitment and dilatation decrease cardiac work. Bronchodilatation, mouth breathing, and decreasing FRC decrease pulmonary work. And maximal cardiac output delivers the maximal O2 to exercising muscle. Let's talk about the anaerobic threshold. If we perform an incremental exercise test, VE increases linearly with O2 and CO2 to a point. Right? And this is until lactate is released in the circulation. And at that point, isocapnic buffering occurs so that CO2 is actually increased. And CO2 and VE increase more than O2 consumption. But you can see that CO2 production and minute ventilation increase together. So isocapnic buffering, all right? So at maximum exercise here, we've got aerobic plus anaerobic metabolism. We're putting lactate into the circulation. So acid plus, in this case, bicarb, equals carbonic acid, which basically divides into water and CO2. So CO2 is created by buffering lactate, extra CO2. This is extra than was measured by CO2 production um, from metabolic sources. Um, but it is measured by a CO2, but it does not reflect a metabolic rate. 
So the anaerobic threshold then, when lactate first appears in the blood, is associated with an additional increase in CO2. And that's shown here. This is the so-called V-slope method to determine the anaerobic threshold, increasing O2 consumption, O2 consumption and uh, CO2 production increase linearly to a point. This is the anaerobic threshold where isocapnic buffering increases CO2 above and beyond oxygen consumption. And so the line bends here. There are also a number of other things that occur at the anaerobic threshold. Minute ventilation, for example, ceases to occur linearly with work. So it starts to increase here. Uh, this is O2 consumption. CO2 production increases more. The R value, which is CO2 production over O2 consumption, increases at the anaerobic threshold. Ventilatory equivalence for oxygen, that remains relatively stable for CO2, but the ventilatory equivalent for oxygen increases while CO2 remains stable. And end tidal oxygen increases at the uh, anaerobic threshold. CO2 perhaps decreases slightly. So lactate is produced when aerobic metabolism can no longer meet energy needs. Greater aerobic fitness delays lactate production at high workloads. Thus, the anaerobic threshold is a measure of aerobic fitness. The anaerobic threshold is defined when lactate from exercising muscle first appears in blood. And as we mentioned, this can be measured non-invasively. Minute ventilation increases linearly with VO2 and VCO2 until lactate is released from the circulation. Then isochemic buffering occurs, and then CO2 production and minute ventilation increase more than oxygen consumption or metabolic rate. This is a measure of aerobic fitness, how much workload before anaerobic metabolism occurs. Steady state exercise is by definition exercise at workloads below the anaerobic threshold. Exercise workloads below the AT are met by aerobic metabolism. Lactate is not being produced. So therefore, theoretically, exercise below the aerobic, anaerobic threshold can be sustained indefinitely without producing lactate. So if I want to win the Olympic marathon, I could or would perform a cardiopulmonary exercise test, find my heart rate at my anaerobic threshold, and run just below that heart rate. This means that energy would all be created aerobically and could be the theoretically sustained for a longer period of time. So when do I kick at the end if I want to watch this like a physiologist? Because this is anaerobic metabolism. If I start to kick too soon, I will not be able to sustain it and I will slow. If I start too late, I may I lose the race. What have we learned about exercise? Strength or power sports use energy, uh, muscle energy from muscle stores anaerobically. There's no time to deliver oxygen exercising muscle to generate energy. They build up an oxygen debt, which must be repaid at the end of the event as oxygen deficit. Aerobic exercise requires muscle energy production. O2 must be delivered to exercising muscle to generate energy. Cardiac function is required for O2 delivery, and the normal limitation of exercise is inability to deliver more oxygen to exercising muscle. Next time, we will continue to discuss exercise physiology, part two, our thanks to our producer and director, Dr. Catherine LeWinter. And thank you for joining me for this, The Great Adventure, Pediatric Pulmonary Physiology.